Good afternoon. My name is Pam Strickland. I am the founder of North Carolina Stop Human Trafficking, and it is my pleasure to welcome you today to the webinar, an overview of the anti-human trafficking movement in North Carolina. We are so glad that you're here with us. Um, as you already have noted, probably we are recording this, just to let you know. I'm going to share my screen, and we are going to get started. First thing I'd like to do is just share with you a little bit about our nonprofit. Uh, first of all, our vision is a state free of human trafficking. And our mission is creating communities that are actively working to abolish human trafficking. I will note that when we say communities, we don't necessarily mean just a geographical community. It could be a faith community or a professional community, a school community. Um, so we're hoping that any uh, group that you're a part of, that um, if you're not already, that after you've watched the uh, webinar today, that you might be inclined to help create a community that's actively working to abolish human trafficking. The ways that we go about trying to do that, um, we have four, and the first is education. Um, we do a lot of education and training for professional groups, for law enforcement, for social workers, school personnel, um, any people that might come into contact with the potential human trafficking victim survivor in the course of their normal work. The reason that's so important a lot of people think that if you're a victim of a crime, then of course you're going to be reaching out and asking for help. But unfortunately, that's not the case with most human trafficking survivors. Um, many of them have a kind of a, an odd combination of both um, being afraid of their trafficker, but they also very often have an affection for their trafficker. So um, they're both afraid to reach out for help and also don't necessarily want to get the trafficker in trouble. So it is, is up to the professionals who might encounter them to be able to recognize the signs of someone who is a potential victim. And so we are a, one organization that is providing that type of training. The second area is collaboration. Obviously, we could not do this work alone. It's a huge problem. It takes everyone working together. And um, you'll see that uh, today as we're going through all the different groups that are working here in North Carolina to stop human trafficking. We're very interested in legislation, uh, both at the state and federal level. Um, we are um, advocating for policies and for statutes that will strengthen uh, our anti-trafficking response. And then finally, we're very interested and engaged in fair trade and the support of um, fair trade certified products in both the buying and selling of those and encouraging people to look for that label when they're in their grocery stores. So if that's not something you're familiar with, we're really not gonna talk about that today, but I encourage you to um, look on our website and learn more about it. Now, the thing people always want to know um, when I meet someone and they um, find out that I work in the anti-human trafficking field and they want to know, well, is it really a problem in North Carolina? How bad is it? Um, and unfortunately, we don't have really good answers to that. Our data collection, honestly, is not that, we don't have a cohesive way of collecting data here in North Carolina. But I'm gonna give you the numbers that I have with a caveat that these numbers are from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. So they don't represent all of the cases that took place in North Carolina. What they represent is um, calls that went to the hotline from North Carolina, and then the cases that were confirmed from those calls. So there are a lot of um, cases that you know, never get reported to the hotline that are um, reported to local law enforcement or to the SBI or the FBI. Um, 
people are identified by domestic violence shelters, or sexual assault agencies, DSS, um, and of course, the many anti-human trafficking groups that we have here in North Carolina. So just want to be clear that this is actually a, a small percentage of the actual cases in North Carolina. But in uh, 2021, there were 922 calls made from North Carolina to the hotline. And as a result of those calls, 223 cases were actually confirmed. And that puts us in the top 15 uh, in prevalence for human trafficking in the US. So I wanted to, of course, the two types of main types of trafficking that we talk about are sex trafficking and labor trafficking. And so this information um, continues to be from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. You'll see that the top venues for sex trafficking here in North Carolina are the illicit massage and spa business, uh, hotel and motel-based sex trafficking, and then pornography. So I thought you might be interested in just hearing about a case that um, happened at a, a massage parlor. Um, we had two women who were sentenced to 18 months. And the interesting thing about this case is not only were they running an illicit massage parlor where people were um, being trafficked, but they attempted to bribe law enforcement um, to provide protection for their massage businesses. So um, that just added another, you know, additional charges for them. Um, but sadly, these mas uh, massage parlors are fairly common across the state. Um, and to my knowledge, there's not really a comprehensive um, way that they're being addressed. So unfortunately, what happens many times is that um, a particular massage parlor will get closed down. Um, oftentimes, now these women went to prison um, partially because they were attempting to bribe law enforcement. Usually um, the people who are in charge of these massage parlors, they just get probation. They really don't get a very heavy sentence. They go across the county line, across the state line and pop right up again. So um, it's something that hopefully our anti-trafficking movement can, can begin to better address in the future. I am guessing that many of you all have heard about this case that happened in the Wilmington area um, where six people were arrested. There were more than 150 victims involved. So this business, Cape Fear um, Escorts Entertainers, has been operating in that area for a number of years. Uh, they recruited women by telling them they were going to get rich dancing. Um, but dancing is not what they were required to do. Um, so thankfully, after a, a very long, intense investigation, um, these folks were arrested um, and hopefully will spend a long time in jail. Another case that you may have seen, it's more recent, um, right before the holidays, um, talk about a severe sentence, six life terms for sex trafficking. Um, amazing. Um, love to see that kind of a sentence. And he, his recruitment method is a very common one for sex traffickers. He's recruiting harmless women, women who are um, addicted to a substance, offers them housing and drugs, um, which sounds great to them um, and they don't understand um, what they're going to be required to do in order to get housing and drugs. Um, you see here, if they didn't follow the house rules, they were abused and coerced. Um, if they tried to leave, they were brought back. So thankfully, this guy is behind bars where he needs to be. Uh, so number three on the side that I showed you was pornography. And I'm just going to be honest with you. There are so many child pornography cases in North Carolina. I couldn't pick just one. So I just put here just a, a sampling of headlines. Um, probably you, like me, see these just about every day where um, adults are being arrested 
for um, either owning or uh, distributing or even producing child pornography right here in North Carolina. Definitely something that needs even more attention. It's getting a lot of attention and it needs even more attention. And the final case that I'll mention um, as we're talking about sex trafficking regards this one that again is, is very recent. Um, we had a teenager who was missing from Cumberland County. Um, she was found in, in Kentucky and you know he had groomed her online, told her he was 19. Um, she, it sounds like she somewhat didn't want to, to actually go with him. Um, anyway, she, he got her to Kentucky and was holding her uh, in a space underneath his house. There was a trap door in his bedroom. Um, thankfully, um, his mom lived in the house or he lived in her house, I'm not sure. Um, she made a call and said there was a domestic disturbance. Came, um, the law enforcement came, he said, oh, you know, she left after we fought. Thankfully, law enforcement didn't uh, take his word for it and continued their search and found this space that was hidden in his bedroom um, under this trap door and were able to rescue this girl and she is back home. Um, so just a terrifying case um, and one that, you know, we are always talking to folks about um, online security and keeping their kids safe online and how important it is to talk to them about, um, you know, that people aren't always who they say they are online. And this this is a case that just really um, hits home and, and proves that to be true. So um, something that we definitely, uh, our organization and others here in North Carolina want to keep doing is talking to parents about their children's safety and lack of safety online. So we'll move from uh, sex trafficking for a moment to talk about labor trafficking. According to the hotline numbers, the top two types of labor trafficking are domestic work and farm work. And you see these numbers are really low. And um, you know what that tells us is um, you know, most of the calls that are going into the hotline from North Carolina are for sex trafficking. And so we just really don't have a lot of data about labor trafficking. Um, I did want to share share with you one case um, that I was aware of that involved domestic work. Uh, it's a, a case that's actually several years old. Um, two girls were adopted in Hong Kong and then brought here to the U.S. by this woman. Um, she would give them, you know, they were told they were going to go to school and, and great things were going to happen. What actually happened is they were forced to work. Um, they were given caffeine pills so they could work longer hours, starved and beaten. Um, finally, the neighbors called DSS and the girls were removed from this home, but um, her charges were dismissed because the judge said she wasn't competent to stand trial. So she was never held accountable um, for the harm that she did to these children. So more data from the National Human Trafficking Hotline. You can see here that the overwhelming majority of victims are female. Um, and of, of those who responded, you know, who answered questions about whether they were citizens or not, um, about you know, twice as many um, foreign nationals as citizens. But you can, again, see from the numbers that not that many of them answered that question. So that um, data is not 100% uh, reliable. We, are, we know that there's a lot of different types of professionals that are involved in the issue of um, stopping human trafficking here in North Carolina. And one of those that has a large responsibility is law enforcement. So we are gonna move now and uh, look at laws and law enforcement in North Carolina regarding this. Um, very briefly, just want to give you a little bit of history about legislation um, regarding human trafficking. 
the first legislation that was passed in the U.S. Uh, that uh, provided a definition for human trafficking, providing some, funded, some funding for services for victims, and also uh, consequences for the perpetrators was the Trafficking Victims Protection Act, which was passed in 2000. So uh, that's the only federal uh, act that I'm going to mention, but that was you know, the, the beginning basically of the anti-trafficking movement. Um, North Carolina didn't pass a state statute until 2009 uh, on human trafficking. It fairly closely mir mirrored the federal law. And then it took us four more years after that to uh, prevent children who are being sex trafficked, um, who are being prostituted by adults, um, to prohibit them from being arrested for prostitution. So in 2013, we passed our safe harbor law. Um, and what that does is, is prevent minors from being arrested for a crime that's being committed against them. In 2015, the General Assembly decided that we needed to be educating our young people about the issue of sex trafficking and um, mandated that sex trafficking uh, awareness and prevention be included in the sex ed curriculum. Um, this was an unfunded mandate. Um, it has been largely ineffective because um, it was. It also didn't have any enforcement mechanism whatsoever in it. So um, there's no consequence for a school or a district not providing that training. In 2017, the General Assembly um, required that certain establishments post the National Human Trafficking Hotline that I referred to earlier. Um, Again, you know, a, a good idea. Um, they required that it be posted um, at anywhere that serves alcohol that has an ABC license, um, at uh, emergency rooms and hospitals and clinics, at, um, I'm trying to remember the word they used, um, travel, um, travel centers. So they were saying airports, bus stations, um, train stations, that kind of thing. Again, a good idea. There was no enforcement mechanism in it. Um, in 2019, uh, the General Assembly decided to make it a lot easier for survivors of human trafficking to get their record expunged. And this was really important because we had survivors who had come out of this horrible situation of being trafficked, who were trying to go to school, trying to get legitimate jobs, um, trying to get good housing, and they all had these records from uh, acts that they were forced to commit while they were being trafficked. And the record, the, the criminal record prevented them from being able to really move forward. So um, this was a good, good first step. Um, I will tell you, it's still really um, time consuming and difficult to get an expunction, um, but this did make it easy. Um, in 2019, uh, the legislation, legis um, General Assembly, required that school personnel be trained um, to in sex trafficking and child sexual abuse. Um, it's a two hour training required every other year. So it's not a lot, but it's it's something. And so um, again, we're, we're glad of it. Um, again, there's no enforcement mechanism. So uh, it's being done in some places and not done everywhere. So, you know, a law is no good unless someone's going to enforce it, right? I kind of made that point a couple of times when we were looking at the laws. So our law enforcement folks have to be trained on the human trafficking laws. So in 2012 um, is when human trafficking was added to the basic law enforcement training here in North Carolina. Um, three years after we passed the law, the first law on human trafficking. Um, so, of course, that is for all of our new people that are going into law enforcement, which meant that folks who had already been law enforcement officers um, were not required to receive any training until 2016 when, um, when it was required that every law enforcement officer in North Carolina have two hours of human trafficking training. Um, so, again, not a lot of training, but at least en enough for them to at least hear the word. Um, 
And they haven't had one of these since 2016. So um, we are hoping that they will have another required training for all law enforcement uh, within the next couple of years to um, refresh and update because so much has changed. Uh, we know so much more about human trafficking and how law enforcement can help to address it than we knew back in 2016. So since they're not receiving um, uh, required training, uh, mandated training, we are very excited when we can provide training to law enforcement. And sometimes we do get invited by agencies to come in and help them understand it. Um, but one way that we're consistently able to provide that training is through crisis intervention team training. And um, we are just delighted that we have partnerships with um, East Point, Trillium, and Sand Hills, which are the three organizations that basically um, facilitate crisis intervention training in basically the eastern half of the state. And we are looking at some new partnerships with um, with the MCOs in the western part of the state um, in this year. So what that means is um, during, so uh, CIT is a week long training where they're learning about, law enforcement is learning about how to interact with someone who uh, may be having a mental health crisis. And um, many times that would of course be someone who is a human trafficking victim because almost all of them are, you know, are suffering from PTSD or some type of trauma related mental illness. Um, so we're able to, um, in the course of that week, have at least an hour, hour and a half, where we're able to go in and explain a little bit about what human trafficking looks like so that if they're encountering someone with those signs that they can identify them and get them the help that they need. Um, so we are, within the last um, few months, have been able to train 41 law enforcement and correction officers. This does not include the EMS um, responders that we have Okay, I have just been uh, informed that that's a typo. <laughs> this should be 411 uh, law enforcement and correction officers. Um, and it does not include um, the EMS folks. Um, and this is through 14 counties where the actual trainings have been located in 14 counties, but obviously um, officers were coming from surrounding counties as well. So another group that we were able to train was the um, the Isaac Field Liaison Officers. They had a conference in Wilmington and asked us to come in and talk about emerging digital trends in recruitment and selling of victims. And we were very honored to be able to do that. I did contact the SBI and ask if they um, would like to participate in this webinar. Um, unfortunately, um, Agent Fillinger declined, but I did want to let you know that we do have a human trafficking unit as a part of the SBI. Their role is to um, assist local law enforcement um, as they have time. And to, their priority is proactively investigating networks of human trafficking. Um, they created as of early last year, uh, this human trafficking unit that Agent Fillinger leads. Um, I, I would love to be able to provide for you, you know, information on uh, how many cases um, they uh, have opened or arrests they've made or uh, more information. Um, but they declined to provide that information. So um, we do know that there is a unit. Uh, the General Assembly has funded eight people for that unit. I don't know how many people are actually, have been hired uh, if the unit is full at this time or not. So um, we did want to talk a little bit about ICAC the International Crimes Against Children Task Force here in North Carolina. And when you look at these numbers, starting in 2019, and you can just see the stair steps, this is the number of tips that were received by 
the National Missing and Exploited Children's tip line. And I mean, the jump is just absolutely incredible. So of course, 2019 is pre-COVID, uh, almost 5,000. And then in 2020, the year COVID hit, almost doubles. And of course, y'all remember what was happening then. Um, our schools were closed. The kids were, um, you know, given laptops to take home and they were all spending so much more time on the internet um, and the predators knew that. And we're going after these kids and we can just see that in the numbers. And uh, even when the kids went back to school, I think they'd gotten really accustomed to being online so much. So, I mean, we just see that the number of tips received has just escalated every year. And even the number that we have here for 2023 doesn't even include December. And it's still a huge jump from the previous year. So that's the tips. So when, once our North Carolina ICAC team um, receives uh, information, you know, they have to decide which ones are viable tips that they're going to investigate. And so we can see these numbers have kind of gone up and down, um, but with a general upward trajectory uh, until this year, which again, it may have um, gone up if we had December. So, um, I'd like to put in a plug to anybody who funds the staff for ICAC that I think they need more people because they look how many tips they got, 24,000, and were able to open 3,000 cases. And then this is the number of arrests that were made as a result of those tips. And um, we see uh, last year that those went up from the previous year, again, um, not including December. So this idea of children uh, being in danger on the internet and uh, we adults needing protect, to protect them is just a huge one that we need to be very aware of. So I wanna look for a moment at the um, overall state charges. This is not just for, um, for minors. The state charges um, for, there are five different charges that are related to human trafficking. So this includes all of them. And you can see that um, we had a dramatic drop last year. And um, I don't have an explanation for that. I um, was you know, disappointed to see that. Um, in our next slide, I can show you the top counties that, um, that had charges. And, you know, these were dramatically lower too. I think uh, Mecklenburg had 27 last year and it was, you know, down to 10 this year. So um, a big drop that I don't have an explanation for. Um, we can see here um, in the number of counties with charges that that's fluctuated some, but the lowest year, the lowest number was this past year, 14 counties. Um, had charges for human trafficking last year. So um, as I said, don't have an explanation for that. We can only hope that it increases. Um, one group that is working on this issue really hard is a group in Cumberland County called the Worth Court. And I am going to introduce to you now Benji Hare, who is the volunteer Worth Court coordinator. And he is gonna, Tell us, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, tell us what it is and a little bit about the work they've been doing. Welcome, Benji. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, Worth Court is um, a idea that came about four and a half, uh, about five years ago. And the first court sessions were conducted four and a half years ago. Um, uh, judge uh, Tony King was then one of our district court judges. She's now our Chief District Court Judge, and she was instrumental uh, along with Judge Steele in, in helping this come about with uh, some funding. Um, Pam had mentioned 2019, and that's the year of the impetus for this court to come about. Uh, WORTH, W-O-R-T-H, stands for We Overcome um, Recidivism Through Healing. 
And that's a lot about of what we are about. Um, this court works with the survivors, the victims of human trafficking, to help them get through the process of healing. Um, with um, human trafficking, there's a lot of trauma. And the survivors uh, find themselves in a situation where, as Pam has talked about, there's a, a lot of uh, healing that has to happen in finding themselves back into a journey of, of life again, uh, finding a job, finding a place to live, restoring relationships, uh, gaining some self-worth. Um, there's a lot of restoration. And so what we are about is the charges that they may have gained through the legal system as a result of being trafficked, we uh, ask and have them take consideration of those charges coming into Worth Court. And over a period of 12 to 18 months being in our court, they will have available to them medical care, dental care, supportive mental health, and substance abuse care, including uh, 30 day or more uh, substance abuse intervention. And during that time, they will have uh, coordinated care management or case management, which will develop a care plan for them. And that care plan will be reported back to the court and to the program managers in the court, um, uh, Daisy Thorne and to Bobby Maddox, who are uh, court uh, staff. And they, along with myself, will evaluate the progress the individual is making toward the ultimate goals set in that care plan. And as they uh, travel through the 12 to 18 months, that care plan will be updated, it'll be revised. At the end of their first 90 days, we'll look at resetting some of the goals that they um, have self-identified themselves and that the counselors that they may have for their mental health or substance abuse needs have set forward for them. And uh, also we'll be looking at their compliance with that. We recognize that, um, and this has been one of the first uh, components of Worth Court, and we are the only human trafficking court in the state of North Carolina, that they um, will need to reset those goals at times because of their trauma issues. Uh, Worth Court has set about looking at what is it that we can do um, as a new diversion court in the state and that we can share with other courts, not only in the state of North Carolina, but outside North Carolina as best practices. So one of the things that we have done is keep track of what we do good, what works for us here in North Carolina, what works for us um, in uh, uh, dealing with human trafficking in a semi-urban area to, to somewhat urban area with a military base sitting next door and a crossroads of two different interstates that are prime areas for human trafficking and what can we do better. So we keep track of our court activities through what we consider a, a best practices log so that we can share that information with other judicial districts that may want to set forward um, with a, a similar kind of court, a, a diversion court like Worth Court. Um, the outcomes for us have been, I think, um, uh, notable in that over the course of these four years, uh, four and a half years, we've had uh, 58 graduates. Uh, we've had 68 individuals basically enrolled in our court program. We have six participants in the court at the moment. Um, one of the things that Pam mentioned was the fact that uh, we had young people during COVID very actively involved uh, working from home on their uh, educational endeavors, and that seized an opportunity there right there for them to become involved with the internet more uh, closely. And as a result of that, we started now seeing more juveniles coming into our, our uh, Worth Court. Ju uh, Worth Court is divided into two different segments a juvenile court and, a, and a, an adult court. Um, we have the participants come to court every other month. So there's a 60 day period that we're working with our court providers. And by the way, these court providers we have with a memorandum of understanding, they are vetted by our uh, court professionals and myself and Judge King. And we look for individuals who are very committed and have some 
training and background in working with trauma. That's the paramount issue that we look for in uh, the court uh, providers for these individuals that come to Worth Court. So that's a little bit of an overview of what we're about. Um, it's kind of a short and sweet version. One other component of Worth Court is we reach out in the community doing presentations. We partner at times with Pam and what um, her organization does. We partner with other human trafficking organizations. And the final component is we do training sessions throughout the community and throughout the region. And we also send people from our community to national training sessions so that we can heighten awareness and education about uh, human trafficking. And our direction for Worth Court is to grow the court so that it's an even stronger element within our community and the 12th judicial system. Uh, all of our uh, participants are at federal poverty, 100%. And also we only have about 11% of the individuals who have actually completed uh, a high school education. So we work closely with our case management providers who are tied into Fayetteville Technical Community College to help the individuals get their GEDs if they need to. So that's a little bit of an overview of us. Benji, thank you so much. Y'all are doing just a, a fabulous job and it's certainly my own personal hope that um, as a result of the good work that y'all are doing there in Cumberland County, that perhaps some um, other counties might decide to, to jump in and have human trafficking court as well. So thank you we're so up. much for sharing. We're open to be a mentor. <laughs> um, so we that's sort of a, um, a peek at something that's going on in a local community and um, now we're going to move to something that's uh, more federal, more um, across a larger part of our state. Um, some of you may remember uh, last year during this session, I um, shared that we had a brand new task force here in North Carolina to address human trafficking, that the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District had um, started this task force. Uh, Brian Stephanie is the person who's leading it. And he has uh, graciously agreed to come with us today and to tell us a little bit about the work that they've been doing. Thank you. Welcome, Brian. You are muted, Brian. There we go. I'll get it right someday. <laughs> Thank you, Pam, for uh, having uh, having me uh, as part of your uh, webinar today. And, and just um, huge thanks to um, you and, and North Carolina Stop Human Trafficking um, and all the work that you do. I think, as, as you said at the outset, it really does require a lot of collaboration. Um, I, I would say it's going to take a holistic approach and no one of us can, you know, have the impact that we all desire alone. And so um, just appreciate all the uh, good work that y'all are doing and, and, and um, you know, all the other partners out there as well. Um, as Pam mentioned, we uh, stood up a uh, dedicated human trafficking task force um, for uh, the raleigh Curry area last year. Um, and I should back up. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm an assistant U.S. Uh, attorney. I primarily prosecute human trafficking cases. Um, our area, we cover um, the eastern district of North Carolina, which is comprised of the 44 easternmost counties. Um, basically runs from Raleigh all the way out to the coast. Um, and so there's a, a pretty um, wide variety. It's a, it's a large area geographically. It's very diverse. Um, you have areas that are, um, you know, very rural and agricultural. Um, you have other areas um, like Raleigh and, and Wilmington and Fayetteville that are a little more metropolitan. Um, there's a lot of um, what we would call hot spots uh, where we see a higher incidence of human trafficking cases throughout the district. Um, oftentimes it centers around um, either um, travel corridors um, through some of our interstate highways, uh, military bases, unfortunately, um, seem to be a focal point. Um, we do see, um, you know, cases throughout the district, um, but, uh, but definitely higher incidences in some areas. Um, and, and in order to address that, um, last year, as Pam mentioned, we uh, decided to stand up a um, human trafficking, a dedicated human trafficking task force um, for one of the areas where we were seeing a, a higher incidence of uh, human trafficking cases, and that was the Raleigh-Cary um, area. 
Um, and so we worked uh, very hard to kind of um, stand that task force up. Um, and um, really the idea was to bring together all the various state, um, federal, local law enforcement partners, as well as um, the prosecution, state and federal, um, for that, that geographic area so that we could all share intelligence um, we could share leads, um, we could share manpower, um, bring together folks who are dedicated to um, eradicating human trafficking um, and, and are invested in, in uh, skilled in investigating these kinds of cases um, and, uh, and be able to collaborate, share best practices. Um, it really is a unique area, I think, for law enforcement and it requires some special skills uh, in the investigation and prosecution. Um, and then we were also able to collaborate um, you know, uh, where cases, uh, you know, might be more appropriate for a state prosecution for whatever reason or a federal prosecution. Um, and we were able to coordinate and collaborate with our, our state colleagues um, on that as well. Um, the uh, task force has grown even since we um, stood it up um, last year. And uh, we now have a, a whole host of members uh, it includes obviously the U.S. Attorney's Office, Wake County DA's Office, Johnson County DA's Office. We've got our federal law enforcement partners. We've got special agents from HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, FBI, um, U.S. Marshal Service. Um, we even have special agents from IRS um, who help us uh, look at the financial aspect of some of these crimes. Uh, North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation um, has joined with us in that task force effort. North Carolina State Highway Patrol, um, Wake County Sheriff's Office, Raleigh PD, Apex uh, Police Department, Cary Police Department. Um, we even have um, St. Augustine's uh, Police Department and the North Carolina Fairgrounds um, uh, uh, folks have even joined in um, to, uh, uh, to learn more, um, to educate themselves, um, even if they don't have a dedicated um, officer to uh, or, or the bandwidth to be able to investigate um, or dedicate somebody solely to human trafficking, um, their participation in the task force allows them to gain awareness, um, have some specific training, and um, be able to take that back to their frontline officers um, who may be encountering victims uh, in their in their day to day. Um, so we've had a lot of success thus far. We've seen increased um, uh, investigations and, and prosecutions um, uh, this year as a result. I think directly of the um, the efforts of the task force. Um, and we've been really encouraged by that. Um, one other aspect of that is we wanted to make sure that we were doing um, uh, the appropriate amount of, uh, you know, community outreach and engagement, training um, and awareness efforts um, and coordinating with our partners, um, because it really does take an entire team um, to, to uh, uh, work these cases and, and uh, make sure that we're providing victims with services so they don't just end up back in a cycle of exploitation. Um, and so we've tried to um, really build and strengthen the partnerships that we have with service providers and, and other community stakeholders and, and our NGO partners. Um, and we did a lot of um, outreach and awareness efforts as well to train not only law enforcement folks, but also uh, medical providers, frontline um, folks in that space, um, as well as um, we even did presentations at colleges uh, and universities in the district, um, which is a demographic that we see a lot of victims come from. Um, and then we also um, uh, engaged in some proactive operations, uh, two actually in the past year, um, one focused on um, uh, recovering minors and, and prosecuting and, and identifying and arresting traffickers, um, and another one um, recently uh, focused on the demand side um, and, uh, and, and tried to target folks that specifically were looking uh, to engage in commercial um, uh uh, sex as and exploit minors um, in, in that respect. Um, and so we feel like we've had a lot of um, uh, success this year and we're really pleased with it. Uh, and I'm, you know, I don't want to get out ahead of myself, but um, as I said, there's multiple areas throughout the district where we've seen a higher incidence of, of cases. Um, and so we're looking to expand that model uh, and, and bring uh, other geographic task forces um, to light. And, and hopefully we'll have an announcement pretty uh, pretty soon here, coming from the U.S. Attorney's Office um, uh, to announce an expanded effort in that respect. Um, I figured we, it, it would make sense to touch on some recent trends um, that uh, that we've seen in our cases. Um, uh, one of them is, is the use of drugs to control and coerce uh, and exploit victims. Um, we still see a number of cases where physical force is being used, um, but a lot of traffickers um, 
understand that that's a, a, a pretty obvious uh, sign and signal uh, of the force fraud coercion that that is so um, key to these um, types of human trafficking charges. And so um, they've resorted to alternative means, psychological manipulation um, and, and coercion. Um, and one uh, mean that we've seen a, a, a big uptick in is the use of drugs, um, particularly highly addictive drugs such as methamphetamine, fentanyl, heroin, the opioids um, are, are, are really big because there's a huge withdrawal uh, component to that um, where victims, if they don't get their, their drugs, um, they're going to be so sick that they'll do pretty much anything um, uh, to get their next, uh, next um, high. And so traffickers have figured this out. Um, oftentimes they'll find victims who ha have, don't even have a, a, an existing addiction. They'll create the addiction uh, so that they can utilize that and leverage that um, to control these victims um, and, and keep them working for them and, and earning money for them. Um, so that's something that we've seen. We've also seen a, a real big uptick. Uh, a lot of traffickers have gotten savvy about how they recruit. Um, and uh, a lot of it is done online through social media. I mentioned we've done some presentations and outreach and awareness events at, at uh, colleges and universities throughout the district. Um, one of them, actually, I think, uh, Pam, you, you were helping us with that uh, presentation over at St. Augustine's University. And we were trying to um, uh, make the, the, the audience and uh, especially the college um, students aware um, that this is out there and, and thought we were sharing some information and a hand raises in the back and says, you know, we, we get these kinds of recruitment messages on a daily basis, sometimes multiple times a day. Uh, so we knew it was, it was happening. We just, um, that was a, a pretty good emphasis for how frequently it's happening and how much traffickers have turned to um, online platforms. It's very easy for them to take one message and, and blast it out um, to so many users in a short amount of time. And, and um, uh, oftentimes, unfortunately, um, they'll, they'll get responses. And uh, then it becomes a slippery slope where they're uh, grooming somebody into the life and, and, uh, and eventually exploiting them and trafficking them. So um, that's another thing that we've seen. Uh, and this is actually uh, one of the uh, examples of, uh, of an ad that uh, we saw trying to um, recruit, and you can see they're, they're targeting 18 to 25 years old, uh, looking for college girls. Um, they'll use a lot of terminology um, like this. They'll, they'll kind of make it out to be a glamorous lifestyle. Um, and uh, sadly, um, sometimes you have somebody who may already have some existing vulnerabilities or, or maybe just they're away from their traditional support network, um, you know, uh, down on their luck in terms of finances, and they're looking for some um, uh, a way to change that, and they'll respond and, and get lured into this this lifestyle. Um, and before they know it, that you know they're sucked in so far they can't find a way out themselves. Um, so that's another uptick we've seen. Um, I figured it made sense just to highlight a couple of federal sentences um, that, that we got uh, during the last year. Um, you can see them up. Uh, on um, the screen here. Uh, several of these cases um, involve um, minors who were trafficked. Um, others um, involve adult survivors um, uh, who were trafficked using force fraud, coercion. Um, and, and some of them involve um, uh, folks that we may have targeted because um, of suspected trafficking. And even if we weren't able to uh, necessarily prove a, um, a, a, a traditional kind of human trafficking charge. Uh, oftentimes we found other illegal behavior um, that uh, we would rely on to obviously, you know, prosecute and, and charge and prosecute them um, in an effort to uh, what I'll call disrupt um, the, uh, what we believe to be the underlying trafficking there. Um, you know, uh, these cases come from Raleigh. Uh, uh, Mr. Bavaro trafficked up and down the East Coast uh, for a number of years, um, ended up getting 15 years. Uh, Mr. Um, Busby, um, the fourth one down there, um, he actually went to trial um, and was convicted and, and received 32 and a half years. Um, and then I think Pam actually already highlighted the uh, um, illicit massage industry um, case uh, that uh, culminated with um, five defendants in the, in the organization being sentenced this past spring. Um, and we were uh, pleased that collectively they, they, they received uh, a ten, 10 years of sentence. The ringleader um, received more than four years. 
um, herself. That, uh, while that doesn't um, compare to you know some of the other uh, the significance of some of the other sentences for that kind of case, um, that was um, a, a pretty big victory in our mind um, because oftentimes, like Pam highlighted, those kinds of cases without the cooperation of victims, um, thanks to language and cultural barriers, um, we often at times have a hard time um, proving the trafficking um, uh, offenses in those cases. And, and um, here are just some, some of the cases that we've indicted. Uh, obviously, this is just federal cases. Um, we work with both our, our, our state partners as well. And so a number of our investigations end up um, being prosecuted on the state for various legal reasons. Um, but these are uh, four cases that we indicted um, this year. And, and um, one involved a 16-year-old minor uh, and a familial trafficking situation. Um, another involved a 12-year-old minor who overdosed, um, uh, and uh, I think Pam highlighted the Cape Fear Escorts um, case. It is now, um, uh, I, I think you, you had over 150 victims. They are now over 230 victims, and the number of state charges have actually gone up. Uh, I think there are over 260 state charges now. Um, he has also been indicted um, federally uh, uh, for additional offenses um, as well, so that uh, is ongoing and there's um, the, the fourth one there involved forced fraud coercion with adult um, uh, victims now survivors um, throughout Onslow, uh, New Hanover, and um, even into the middle district um, and, and outside the state as well. Um, have to note all defendants are presumed innocent until proven guilty, um, but those are uh, we were proud that we kind of doubled the number of cases that we indicted um, uh, this year and, and, and we credit some of our task force efforts with that. So thank you, Pam. Brian, thank you so much. Um, just really appreciate you being here and sharing with us the, the work that's going on at, at the federal level. Really interested too in hearing that um, you're partnering um, at the state level. And if, if, you know, if it's gonna work out better to go state, you go state. If it works out better to go federal, you go federal, you know, you work it out. So, um, just thank you for all the work that you're doing. We really appreciate you and, and your team. We are gonna move now. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about law enforcement because it is such a huge part of um, the anti-human trafficking world. Um, wanna switch over now for a moment and look at the Department of Social Services. Um, so, Back in 2013, um, when the Safe Harbor was first passed, um, part of what it said, uh, what the legislation said, is that if law enforcement encounters a minor who has been um, involved in commercial sex, then they are to, to be turned over to the local uh, Department of Social Services. Um, which sounds reasonable since DSS, you know, takes care of um, minors. Unfortunately, um, there hadn't been, you know, any discussion of that with DSS before this legislation passed, and they were, you know, completely unprepared. They hadn't been trained, and I'm not saying this to disparage DSS. I mean, they, they were not consulted. They didn't know. Um, so they have done a lot of work since that time, um, obviously, to try to get their people trained. And the other thing that they have, have done is change their intake form um, to include questions that will help um, help social workers as they're, they're doing these intakes to determine whether or not a minor has been a victim of human trafficking, either sex trafficking or labor trafficking. Um, so this intake form, um, these um, questions that have been added, um, you know, I think are, are just incredibly helpful as a screening tool. Um, unfortunately, um, the way that the DSS is structured here in North Carolina, the state level, um, the folks in Raleigh can say, okay, here's our new intake form. They send it out to all 100 counties and the counties get to decide um, what intake form they use. They don't have to use the one that comes from the state. So many of them are not using the intake form that has these updated questions, which is, is really discouraging. Um, and I'm sharing that with you, hoping that you all are going to go out to your local county DSS and find out 
know which version they're using and I encourage them um, to use the version that includes these uh, questions about human trafficking. Um, this is just an example of one of the trainings that DHHS did um, several years ago, and I know they've done uh, several since then, um, to be sure to get their employees up to speed and understanding what human trafficking is. Um, one thing that I would like to encourage you is that, you know, if you in your community see something that you suspect could be human trafficking, um, in this particular case involving a minor, when you make a call, first of all, make a call <laughs> for sure, um, make that call, you are not responsible for determining if that child is a victim of human trafficking or not, okay? You're responsible for making a call if you suspect that. And we are all mandated reporters here in North Carolina if you're over 18. Um, so make that call, but use the word human trafficking in your report so they will know to, to look specifically for that. And be aware that, um, that you can make a report whether or not it involves um, the child's guardian. Um, DSS used to have a policy that they could only get involved in cases that involve the child's um, parent or legal guardian and an exception has been made um, in cases of trafficking. So that if it's, for instance, a, a, I almost never use the word pimp, but I'll use it in this case. If there's a, a pimp out in the community that's recruiting this child, um, then that child can still receive services from DSS, okay? Even though it's not the parent that's doing the uh, abuse. Um, so the main thing is to call to call, whether you're absolutely sure or not, not your job to prove it, your job to make the call. So now we're gonna move on to what is my favorite part of this, this overview, which is talking about all the different organizations, um, nonprofits, a um, couple of agencies as well, that are working, um, working together in the anti-human trafficking movement here in North Carolina. Uh, the first I'll mention is the North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission. Um, this is a group, uh, this commission was created by the Safe Harbor statute actually. And so all the people who serve on this commission are appointed um, by the governor, by the um, Senate pro tem and by the house speaker. Um, so they're all appointed positions. They meet every other month. They are oops, uh, funded by the legislature, uh, they receive, wow, I'm sorry, y'all. <laughs> they um, receive $336,000 in recurring operating funds every year. Um, that is to fund their non-employees and all the expenses um, incurred in operating a commission. That They have 15 commission members. And these meetings are open to the public. You can join either online or in person. And so uh, the next meeting is February 22nd. And I encourage you, if you have never done that, to um, you go to their website, just type in North Carolina Human Trafficking Commission. You'll, and you'll get there. Um, go to the page that, that says um, regular meetings, general meetings, I think it says. Um, and it'll have a um, information there and you'll be able to link to that on the day of the meeting, or you can go to the address there um, in person. So this is a, as I said, you know, it's a public commission that's working for us. So I encourage you to, um, to go and attend that. And then at the end, they normally have a time for public comments if there's something you would like the commission to know. A couple of things they have done um, to be, oh, excuse me. Um, I did want to, to highlight too that the General Assembly has given, given them half a million dollars in recurring funds to disperse to nonprofits that are serving human trafficking victims. And they have just opened um, a grant application two days ago. So definitely if you are providing services to human trafficking victims, um, 
go to their website, click on the, the link for um, grants. I'm going to be honest with you. It's a little bit hard to find. I had to scroll down for a while, but the, the keywords to look for just this top line, section 16.21, and look for the words round two. Um, and you can see here that it's due March 8th. So strongly encourage you to, to take a look at that. So a couple of resources that they have developed to assist the movement in North Carolina. Um, one is they have a resource directory and they have recently been working to get that updated. And there is a link also on their page where you know, if you look at it and you see that your information for your organization isn't correct or your organization isn't listed, there's an email um, for you to correct that information. This is great because every group that they're aware of that's doing anything to, um, to work in the anti-human trafficking movement is listed in this online directory. So it's a, a huge help. So I encourage you to, to take a look at that. The other thing that they've done that is tremendously helpful is create standards of care um, for victims of human trafficking in North Carolina. And um, what they have done since then is they've also created an assessment. So in order to receive funds from the Human Trafficking Commission, from their grant uh, system, you will have to have completed the assessment to determine whether or not you're meeting their standards of care. And this is, um, you know, the sole reason behind that is just to benefit our victim survivors here in North Carolina to be sure they're getting the best care possible. Um, so just, uh, again, you can find this on their website. Another group that is fairly new is the North Carolina Demand Reduction Task Force. And um, full transparency, our group, uh, NC Stop Human Trafficking, is one of the founders of this group. Uh, we are having our first statewide conference in May, and I strongly uh, encourage you to make note of this date and put it on your calendar. We will have registration out um, within, you know, 30, 60 days uh, before the actual conference. We are looking at some really good national speakers. Um, really encourage you to, like I said, mark your calendar, save the date, and we'll be providing more information soon. The whole idea behind this group is to create a plan for North Carolina um, where we are addressing demand for both sex trafficking victims and labor trafficking victims and figuring out what are the best strategies to reduce demand for both of those. And we're doing research all over the country to see what other um, states and municipalities have done. Um, we're looking at, you know, education obviously is one thing you can do to reduce demand. For some people, it takes jail time. Um, for some people, they actually need, you know, treatment, um, mental health care. So um, we're looking at all the different options and just to invite you to come and learn with us at this conference. Another group that I'm imagining most of y'all have heard of is Legal Aid of North Carolina. They have two uh, different um, departments or, or units within um, their organization that are related to human trafficking. The first is the Farm Workers Unit, which obviously assist farm workers who are being exploited, but they also um, assist other, other people who are being exploited for labor. And then the Battered Immigrants Project, which has recently changed their name. Um, and unfortunately, I forgot to change it. My apologies. Um, but what this group does is help um, any immigrants who are victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, or sex trafficking. So if you are a service provider and need legal assistance in either of those two matters, please reach out to Legal Aid. Another group that's been around um, a fairly long time is the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Trafficking. Um, they have gone through sort of a, a, a reset in the last several months, and they are having a meeting tomorrow. Um, if you would like to be involved with them and haven't received a, an email about this meeting tomorrow, um, 
please go to their website and send an email and I bet that they will be, be glad to provide information for you. Shield North Carolina is a partner of NC Stop Human Trafficking and also one of the co-founders of the Demand Reduction Task Force. They are doing terrific training work. Um, they specialize in having a, a different training um, for, um, I won't say every audience, but for their different types of audiences based on the person's profession, the service they offer, and their activities. Um, so that everyone can look for the signs in their everyday life. So we are just pleased to partner with them. Many of you will be familiar with NC CASA, the Coalition Against Sexual Assault. Um, this actually was probably the first nonprofit in North Carolina to do any um, human trafficking work. They were receiving calls um, that involved sexual assaults, but it wasn't exactly just a sexual assault, you know, and they um, they had to figure it out and um, began to learn about sex trafficking and um, helped start the group that eventually became the North Carolina Coalition Against Human Trafficking. So um, we, we owe the anti-trafficking movement in North Carolina uh, owes a lot to NC CASA. And what they are continuing to do now, um, obviously their main focus is victims of sexual assault and agencies who serve them, um, but they do have a human trafficking program coordinator who pr provides trainings. Um, and Courtney would be glad to, to tell you more about it. Our organization, of course, um, has been here since 2010, providing uh, training, collaborating, advocating for legislation. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, we are a membership organization and would love to welcome you as a new member, um, either as an individual or if you are an agency or a nonprofit um, or even a, a business owner. You can just go to our website and click on that tab. We would love to have you. We have been told by numerous people that where they get their information about human trafficking is from our newsletter. <laughs> So we take great pride in that. Um, we, in our newsletters, um, have a list of every training that we are aware of, whether it's in person or online, that regards human trafficking. And if your organization is having an event that will educate people or create awareness, you're welcome to send that to us and we'll be glad to put it in our newsletter. Um, if you would like to sign up for that, then you can just go to our homepage and scroll down to the bottom of the homepage. Many people um, want to share information about human trafficking, but may find it a little awkward to talk to people one-on-one. -on -one. So one way that you can share information is of course through social media. And we just invite you to um, follow all of our different uh, social media platforms. And that's by sharing those, that is um, one way that you can just increase education and awareness in, in the community about human trafficking. We are so excited to tell you that we are having a screening of the documentary that we produced uh, with funding from the Governor's Crime Commission. It is going to be in Raleigh on the NC State University campus on Thursday, January 18th. And so we'll have um, some of us there, I'll be there um, to introduce it. Then we will um, screen the film and then have a, a Q and A time. So we'd just love for y'all to come. Again, you can go to our uh, website to register for that. The next webinar that we have coming up is Human Trafficking 101. And we have completely revamped our 101. And so if you've seen us, uh, seen one of our webinars before, invite you to check this one out. Um, it's going to be a lot shorter, so it'll be easier to get scheduled. Um, and it's just going to have a, a more contemporary touch. So we invite you to uh, go to our website and register for that. The last thing I'm going to ask you to do 
is to remember that tomorrow is Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Day. And that's the day we're all asked to wear blue and just invite you to ask your whole office to wear blue, take a picture, put it on social media, hashtag human trafficking awareness or hashtag um, stop human trafficking. Um, just get it out there to let people know that you're wanting to be involved in the anti-human trafficking movement. The last slide that I'm gonna show, it just has our emails, um, mine, our chief operating officer, Melinda Sampson, and our training and community outreach coordinator, Vanessa Berriman. You are welcome to give any of us a call if you have questions or if you are interested in a training. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I am going to check at the Q&A in the chat and see if anyone has any questions for us. And feel free, y'all, I don't think I mentioned that at the beginning, so my apologies. So if you do have a question for either me or for Brian or Benji, um, please feel free to, to put that in there now. While y'all are thinking about that, I am going to ask Benji and Brian if they have any last comments they would like to meet to make as we are closing. I just want to make one comment of something Brian said about some of the cases he had, and that is the familial relationship in, in some of the cases. Um, I know with uh, what we end up with or the, the kind of the tail end of some of the situations where the individuals have uh, come to us after the fact of being trafficked and we're dealing with their trauma, we're dealing with their lasting effects of being trafficked and and, and, and compounded on that is the family dynamics in it. And um, when, when Brian said that, I thought, you know, that's, that's one of the things that so often is forgotten is the family dynamics involved in it, where a family member um, is involved in trafficking another family member. And I think one of the sad things that we've found with Worth Court um, in our juvenile court component is that a family member can traffic a juvenile family member and the the course of what happens with that juvenile's life going forward from there. It's a pretty sad scenario. And so we have had to learn in Worth Court how we deal with those dynamics. And there's really no prescribed manner to go about this. I mean, even our best therapists that work with us don't quite have a script to use. We have to, we're still learning the pathway for that point of care. So. Benji, that is a, just a really good point. Um, the familial trafficking is something that we as a movement have been learning more about. You know, I would even say within the last five or six years, um, when I first um, got involved with this, it wasn't something that was hardly ever talked about. And then I think as the movement really um, got stronger and adults began to realize as they heard about human trafficking, oh my gosh, that's what happened to me <laughs> when I was a kid. That's what that was. And so we've had more and more adults to kind of step forward and talk about familial trafficking um, and what it looks like. And it's something that, you know, it's like you said, Benji, nobody knows that it's going on until it's way too late because it is within the family. You know, it, it's not anything that is easy to, to identify while it's going on. So um, thank you for, for bringing that up. And we've even found that it's intergenerational. And, and that's something that's a dynamic we didn't even consider. And, and so we're still discovering quite a bit of the dynamics surrounding that. Anything from you, Brian? I, I think that's 100% right. I mean, anybody that's involved uh, in, in trying to assist survivors or, or prosecute or investigate these cases know they're incredibly hard and and the trauma that victims suffer um is is hard to um hard to really um describe and appreciate and understand and i think that is only amplified 
when you have a situation involving familial trafficking. Um, I mean, talk about the, the, the trauma bonds and, and, you know, the inner conflict of, of um, survivors who, you know, recognize that their trafficker is also a loved one. Um, it, it just really compounds it. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's something that we all need to be aware of. I'll also, um, Pam, you said something in your presentation um, for the uh, directory uh, of it, any service providers that might be um, listening and kind of encouraging folks to update their information. Um, I'll just, uh, uh, shameless additional plug on that. Um, I know a lot of our law enforcement partners when they're recovering a victim at two in the morning uh, and looking for some emergency services, um, if they don't have somebody else to call or have an existing relationship already, they try and rely on that directory. Um, and I know I've talked to some, some folks recently um, who have tried to utilize that directory and, and found that some of that information is out of date. So just really, I know it's a small thing, but um, to the extent folks haven't looked at it and made sure their information is up to date and the services they provide are up to date, um, just encourage everybody to do that because um, at the moment, that's really the only um, resource out there for, for you know, um, law enforcement to utilize in, in the dark of the night when sadly oftentimes is, is when they're recovering these victims, so. All right, well, thank you for that, Brian. I will say, that part of what we say to law enforcement is don't wait until you have a case in the middle of the night. We try to encourage, you know, let, let's develop some partnerships before there's a crisis. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. But, but yeah, I totally understand what you're saying. Um, so someone has asked in the chat, what is the greatest need right now for groups and organizations regarding investigations or research? Aside from organizations like Isaac or ICAC, but more on the advocacy side, I mostly see volunteer opportunities surrounding trauma skills or fundraising. Um, is there anything either of y'all would like to? At least from the investigative side, I know our biggest um, need right now is, is kind of that immediate temporary housing. Um, it's There's a dearth of resources right now at least for the Eastern District, um, and only a handful of folk, uh, organizations that are able to provide that. That's our biggest need of, from, from an investigative side. Yeah. And I will say, Brian, you know, we work with um, our multidisciplinary team partners here in in Pitt County, and I mean, and we talk to people across the state just like you do. That's everybody's biggest problem. <laughs> um, emergency housing is just. Um, Gosh, and not the emergency housing, yes, but then even where you move them to after that, the transitional housing is also, um, we just don't have enough of it. Yeah. Did you want to yeah. say something, Benji? No, I agree with that. And I think also the other need is really to assess across the state what these different agencies are really getting done and, and finding some baseline financial support for them because that's key to keeping them surviving because a lot of agencies have just about nickel and dime and all they can out of their community. We've got a lot of support uh, for providers that when we didn't have resources or haven't got resources, they'll still provide the therapy services and those other kind of professional services. But some of the, the basic kind of financial service needs, we don't have that. And so, We've been able to keep afloat and uh, in a sense, but that's one of the things I think really has to be looked at for, you know, we've got to keep these agencies that are really putting forth all this effort and energy like NC Stop Human Trafficking and others. We got to keep them there. I mean, we can't have them go by the wayside, um, you know, and if you get a good housing provider in place, it may be counties over, it may be 100 miles away, especially as juveniles and placing juveniles. We've got a crisis situation in the state on placing juveniles. We have a major crisis about placing juveniles. Um, and we, we need that to be addressed. It is just a sorry day on placing juveniles. Benji, I really appreciate you bringing up the matter of funding. Um, we see over and over again, um, in, you know, in talking with our partners across the state, that funding is such a huge issue for nonprofits working on the, the human trafficking issue. And 
it's it's difficult for those that are providing direct services, but for those that are like ours that doesn't focus on direct services and provides training and provides you know uh, legislative advocacy and and provides support for uh, multidisciplinary teams and coalitions and all these things that kind of keep the movement going. <laughs> Um, I mean, yes, we need the direct services, but you need all this other stuff around it. Um, our, for instance, the funds that were made available to the uh, Human Trafficking Commission only for direct services. Right. Um, so to the extent that anyone on this call um, has the ear of any of our legislators, let them know, you know, those those grant funds need to be available also to organizations that are providing support services um, for our direct victim providers. Let's see. Um, I don't see any more questions. Um, Benji and Brian, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate your willingness to come and share with us the work that you're doing and you know, to sort of invite us into that. Um, I'm just really grateful and look forward to continuing to work with both of you. I have to say that one of the things that that is a benefit out of the work is when you see the individual that after, say, 12 months or 18 months that we've worked with, they are back on their feet and they're making a success out of their life. Um, and um, we had one individual that on a Friday afternoon overdosed twice that night on fentanyl. And by the grace of God, by Tuesday morning, I had her in treatment and she has done very well. Uh, she's been working and she's got her, her six-year-old son back with her. And when you see those kind of success stories out of what you didn't know whether you'd ever see that day, daylight again, that makes a difference in what is, is worth the effort. So um, we're about helping people get their life back so thank you for that benji thank you for your work last comment brian just thanks to everybody uh pam especially you for facilitating this and all the great work that um you and your organization do i know how dedicated you are i, I see it uh personally and 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 can't thank you enough for it and, and everybody tuning in for the interest um and uh, all that you do and 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 the um efforts that folks put forth it really is going to take everybody to have an impact in this space and um, just appreciate um everybody uh and their effort and their enthusiasm so thank you all right thank y'all we will see you at human trafficking 101 in a few weeks okay. <laughs> take care all right. wear blue tomorrow all right take care bye-bye bye-bye